It's okay to say it. These are hard times. And hard times can divide even close communities. Even us. Exactly when we need each other the most. But this is our prayer. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude toward each other that Christ has. Let's glorify God with one mind and with one voice. Let's accept each other just as Christ accepts us to bring praise to our God. That's what the church does in the same room or all over town. We endure in Christ together. We praise our God together. Find someone, find a way, let's be the church this week. Welcome. What a joy to worship again with you this morning. Thank you so much for joining us in person. If you're watching us online, welcome. Uh, so great to um, have of you have you joining us. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And uh, it's been amazing with these live streamings that we just um, reaching really, you know, even people in South Africa and I'm, I'm sure some other countries as well. And uh, I know my family's watching and Christus family's watching and my in-law, so I better behave, uh, which is very difficult for me to do in any case. So just uh, so I'll try and remember that to behave. But again, thank you so much. And uh, what, the, what a joy to, again, to just worship with you this morning, lifting up our Savior and to be the church, right? To come here this morning and to be edified and to be equipped. Um, because we get to be the light into this very dark world <laughs> right now with many challenges. And so what a great opportunity to just come and to be lifted up. And I pray that you will lift up uh, maybe some friends here this morning uh, while continue to stay six feet apart, I guess. And, uh, but uh, again, after, I just want to encourage you to join us for some coffee. We have some coffee and uh, we'd love to... Uh, Continue to just be in fellowship with one another. We have several announcements. We actually have a video. Uh, but before I show you the video, Christo wants to uh, just remind uh, us this morning of this fundraiser that they're doing. Um, they've got 25 Subway cards left. They're going for $10 each. I think the value is about $50, so that's quite a deal. Um, but it expires the end of August. So, you gotta get one and eat five Subways this week, <laughs> all right? So if you love Subway, and again, I heard you lose weight if you just do Subway. So there's the motivation. So make sure to connect with him right after uh, the service and he can help you to uh, get one of these as well. If you get a chance, go down to our text room. Then you get your steps in as well, your 10,000 steps. And you can go and see some of the changes there. The, the youth has been very busy painting and updating the text room, and it just looks great. So after the service, before you grab your, your cup of coffee, go down there and look at it and give our kids a high five. They've been working very hard in, in painting. And if there's anything off with the paint, that was the part that Christy was painting. So just um, give him a hard time about that as well. Um, let's uh, pay attention to the screen. Well, good morning and welcome to Salem Covenant Church. If you're joining us for the first time, we're glad you could be here. Or if you're watching online, thanks for tuning in. In just a few moments, we're gonna sing some songs and then Pastor Stephen is gonna start us on our new two week series on what does the Bible say about biblical justice. Before we start, let's look at a few events happening this week. Tomorrow, August 24th, the church office will be closed for staff training. If you still need to get a hold of someone, you can leave a message on the church phone or call Pastor Stephen's cell phone. 
Alpha class will be meeting this Tuesday at Pastor Stevens' house at 6.30. This coming Wednesday, there will also be training for anyone who wants to be involved in Anchored or in the nursery. This will be at Pastor Stevens' house at 6 o'clock. This Wednesday, the youth group will be having their beach party. We'll meet at the church at 6 o'clock, and then we'll go for our last event for the summer before the kickoff starts on September 16th. So, all you teenagers, all you, you better be there. Men's fraternity is starting up again on September 1st, so all you men are welcome to come to the church at 7 a.m. for some good fellowship, coffee, and just generally a good manly time. If you plan to be involved in the nursery, in Anchored, or in the youth group, we will have safe place training on September 9th here at the church. We now have a prayer wall on the Salem website. You can go to the main page and click on prayer at the top. That will take you to a page where you can post a prayer and then others can respond to your prayer, letting you know that they're praying for you. Labor Day weekend, we'll be having another outdoor service with a picnic included, so you can bring your own picnic basket. Ladies, September 12th, there's gonna be a Ladies Day Out at Covenant Park Bible Camp. Registration is $25, and you can register in one of the pamphlets in the front lobby of the church, or you can register on the camp website. Contact Von Noble if you have any questions. Hi everyone, this is Vanessa, and I would like you to go and think and pray about being a Kids Quest teacher this upcoming semester. We have a really fun program planned, and uh, there will actually be a video lesson provided for you that you can play in the classroom. So all that we really ask of you is to help the kids with the activities and crafts that we have planned for them. And uh, I think this is a really great opportunity to get involved and uh, really invest in the lives of our kids. If you have any questions or need more information, please contact me. Thank you. Well, thanks again for joining us and I hope you have a great worship time. So just one more uh, correction. Um, our training is not going to happen this Wednesday. It actually is moving to September 2nd at church. It was going to happen at my house, um, but there's a couple of things that still need to fall in place. So it's moving to September 2nd for everyone that is working with Anchored or in the nursery. Um, Anchored nursery is one more. Okay, Kids Quest. Thank you, Vanessa. September 2nd, uh, it's a Wednesday. Um, at 6 p.m. right at church. That's all the announcements. Will you please stand with me and let's uh, pray. Father God, thank you so much for just this sacred moment this morning to once again be in your presence amongst your people. And Father, it is our desire this morning to just lift you up again as King, as Savior, as Lord. And so Holy Spirit, we just give you permission this morning to minister to us again. I pray that you will encourage us, that you will challenge us, that you will transform us to look more and more like you. And so we just give you this space and we pray now, Lord, that you will receive this worship. Father, as we sing this in spirit and in truth, as we declare this morning that you are righteous, that you are just, that you are a loving Father. And so we want to just declare these truths this morning as we worship you and as we sing unto you. So receive all of the praises. Receive our love this morning as our prayer that our hearts will connect with your heart. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's worship our Savior.
Jesus, my God, 
the redeemed. Jesus, this morning we want to surrender all to you. We want to give it all to you, Lord. We worship you. All to Jesus I surrender. Jesus, this morning we want to make you our number one priority. Nothing else. We want to put you first, Lord. I want to invite you just to close your eyes for a second. And I want to tell you a quick story. Think about this. I was meeting with a close friend and he told me something that really stuck with me. He said, there's a lot of things that is happening in this world. But first, before everything else, before I'm black or white or before I'm this party or that party, just before everything else, I am first a child of God. That is my first and final authority. I am a child of God. Then I am a husband and a father and then I am either whatever culture whatever group and this morning we're going to do this chorus again I surrender all and I want to invite you to truly surrender all unto Jesus let's put him first we are first a family and children of God together Surrender all to him this morning. Grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you this morning. Um, I am excited to kick off uh, our two-week series on biblical justice. Probably a little nervous as well. 
um, because it is such a, a heated topic <laughs> in our world right now. But I'm excited in a sense because I think the world is ready to hear how do we respond. And I think there's been so much confusion in the last several months, especially in the church, on what do I do? Do I, do I respond and then I look like a liberal <laughs> uh, or as a Democrat? Um, do I just pray? Do I just ignore it? What do I do? What is the biblical way in responding? And I pray that in the next two weeks that you will have clarity in how to respond. And so a disclaimer is I'm going to use a lot of scripture. I want to lay a foundation. I've done my homework, I think, um, in studying God's word. So when it comes to God's word over the next two weeks, I'm open. If you have a different interpretation, I'll listen to you, but I, I have done my work. Uh, but then I'm going to share with you some of the stuff, my opinion. And you might not agree. And that's okay. You can convince me otherwise by a cup of coffee in Starbucks. All right? So I want to encourage you if you say, man, Stephen, you just upset me this week. And here's why I this Before I'm going to listen, I'm going to say, just meet me at Starbucks. And then you can convince me otherwise. I am open to hear you out because some of this stuff is just my opinion. And I have many presuppositions because I'm from South Africa and the way I see things are very different maybe on some things on how you see things. And so hopefully that will be clear where stuff is, is scriptural and where some of the stuff is gonna be just my interpretation, my presupposition, the way that I think on, on certain things. And so again, uh, call me, email me if you don't agree. That's okay. That's what family do, right? Um, a ground rule for us, I think that is going to be very helpful for you sitting here, for you that, that's watching, is this. And Chris, you kind of shared a little bit about it. As we look at this difficult topic over the next two weeks, it is going to be important to look at scripture, some of the things I'm sharing with you, through the filter as a believer, as a child of God. Like I said, I mean, when you um, Instagram, Facebook, you know how we put on the different filters and how that changes the, the image? I think to, to get the most accurate image on biblical justice over the next two weeks, you have to have the filter on as child of God. And you cannot listen to this stuff the next two weeks from a political perspective. All right? So if you're a strong Democrat, if you're a strong Republican, strong capitalist, and everything in between, independent, it's okay. But I'm going to ask you to check that for the next two weeks at the door and just to interpret this stuff through scripture and then we're going to be okay and then you can take it home you can chew on it and again reflect through your political uh, lens through some of this stuff but it's going to be important for us to look at this and our identity as believers is that a deal can i hear amen yeah. all right and then we're going to be in great shape. So I've struggled. This is such a big topic. I have two Sundays of about half an hour. So if I go longer today, forgive me, still buy me a cup of coffee, and I want to give you the freedom to go home somewhere. It's like, man, it's too hot, it's too tough with the mask. I totally get it. You are dismissed. You're already dismissed. And you can finish the rest of my sermon when you get home. Okay, is that okay? <laughs> so, we might not go over time. I'll try and be sensitive. But if we go five minutes, forgive me. 
But this is such an important topic. I want to just really minister and speak to you um, the next two Sundays. Now, I struggled with the tone for this morning. Because I had all of these uh, definitions, and then it's like, man, I don't want to bore you guys. So I'll do that next week. So really come excited next week, okay, for tons of definition. So I want to give you a biblical foundation this week for biblical justice, and, but I also want to challenge your heart. Is that okay? Now... The problem with, as we think about social justice, because there's a big difference between social justice and biblical justice, I will go into it more next week. I'm going to give you one difference today, um, is to show you what I think is happening in our world, um, I have to show you something that's actually, if you, if you watched many years ago, there was a movie, The Water Boy. Did you guys see that? Adam Sandler, silly movie. Um, deep doctrine. No, I'm just kidding. The mom used to say all the time for different things. She's like, it is from the devil. Okay? So to give you my illustration on social justice, I have to show you something that I think is from the devil. It is slime. Slime. I don't know why they're allowing this stuff in homes. It ruins furniture and clothing. I have found this stuff in so many, Haley is actually banned from slime. So it was a humbling call this morning. I said, honey, can I use some of your slime for a sermon illustration? I think she enjoyed that. The problem with social justice is that, wow, this is sticky. See, this is why it should be banned. <laughs> I hope our custodian is not seeing this. Um, oh, this stuff is terrible. Should have brought the Haley brought the cheap stuff for me this morning. With social justice, just like slime, we can manipulate it to fit our need or our political agenda and that is the the challenge that I have with social justice because there's not a good foundational piece that you can work off from and so depending on which organization or political party they're gonna bend this thing to make it work for them and that's a challenge for us as believers. So I think that's why it's so important to have a biblical foundation on biblical justice. And there's some really good, and over the next couple of weeks, I will um, share some of those with you. Can you get me a paper towel, honey, please? Okay. It's going to be otherwise a weird morning here. This was such a silly illustration. Why did I decide on this? I saw some other ones that was much better. Okay, don't call me or email me about slime and the devil this week, okay? I was just a joke. So I'm just waiting for Vanessa. Sorry. I didn't think this was going to be this bad. Hold on. Well, that's one illustration in my career that went south. <laughs> mm. Probably won't be the last. Yeah. I want to just share with you kind of my, over the years, uh, my involvement in biblical justice. Just to let you know why I think I can talk about this. And so... Um, Vanessa's family, I've got a photo here, and usually my in-laws, my mother-in-law always have some bad jokes about her and stuff, but 
I have to uh, brag on them as a family a little bit this morning. And so, um, this, I, I can't even remember the, the date, but this was 94, 93, maybe in that area. Um, they adopted in South Africa um, a little black boy. Now, the connection was Fricky, Vanessa's brother, um, made friends with this black kid in school. Just a great, great kid. And they discovered that at night he sleeps on the street with his mom. They had no place to go. And somehow he got dressed every morning, his school uniform, and go to school. And they adopted him in a time where that was unthinkable in South Africa. It was not a cool thing to do. It wasn't a hip thing to do. It was actually quite challenging on certain things. Um, several times where they had to, maybe in a restaurant or a public swimming pool, where people was like, hey, this kid can't swim in here or can't eat in this restaurant. And the where they had to say, this is our son. He's staying. Um, he was very involved in our youth ministry. And um, I'm, I'm so proud of him. He's involved now in an organization that, builds, that does team building. And he gets to preach the gospel. Quite often, I, I had a little video that uh, somebody shared with me where he's just preaching the gospel passionately. And he's posting quite awesome stuff on Facebook. I was like, yeah, go classy. And I'm so proud, I'm so glad there's a family that took, saw that need and said, man, we're going to stand up for justice here. For me, that's Black Lives Matter. In our youth group, um, we did, we had the opportunity to go, I had the opportunity to go into a village, nearby village, and uh, got invited to speak into the youth community. They were trying to figure out how do we, how do they start like a youth ministry in this black community? And so at some point, so I went to several meetings, it was wonderful to you to see their passion for the Lord and as they're trying to figure out resources and how do they get this thing going. And therefore, season, our youth ministry, again, which was kind of unheard of, took um, some of these kids in. We had these taxis just full of kids Sunday nights in our youth ministry. It was quite chaotic. <laughs> um, but the Lord was good. And so here's some, you see some of them, not all of them. This was, uh, I think, my last Sunday or something as the youth pastor at recess. So there was a much younger Stephen, much skinnier, uh, a much younger Chris too as well <laughs> uh, in this picture. And so it was just so amazing to work with them and to be on the edge, to be on the front lines, to say, man, you know what? We're in this together. We're all created in the image of God. And then I moved to Fairmont. Uh, Vanessa, we moved to Fairmont. And I heard about this organization, Kids Against Hunger. And I, we raised money, our youth group. We went over to Mankato many times and packed food. And it was just, it was so exciting to see our kids. They just loved getting their hands to have this tangible, thing that you can actually do that you know is making a difference. And so they did that, and then we got the opportunity to host a community packing event in Fairmont, and our kids just worked so hard raising. We had to raise, I can't remember how much money, but the kids did it. They had benefit concerts, and they went to the school, got involved, and they raised money, and <clears throat> that ended up into maybe four or five years of community packing days. Hundreds of uh, thousands of meals. 
and I don't even know how much money they, they brought in. And then it was so cool when we moved to Duluth, um, we were able to bring some of that same vision and then Cindy Johnson was just vital in organizing stuff. And we did that. We, how many years did we do that? Three years, two years? And, and I don't know which one, I have so many of these little, this is, uh, oh, this is the Fairmont one. On this one, we did 94,000 meals. Uh, can you remember how many meals we did? I should find that little certificate again. But I mean, it was amazing how the Lord provided the finances because there was some, as, as our packing day came closer, we were like, how are we going to raise all this money? And the Lord provided, and through you. I mean, just your generous giving and in our community. And it was like, wow, we're making a difference. We're, we're doing this biblical justice thing. And then in Fairmont, we had a... I met this, this lady in an organization that I was part of. Um, her name is Esther. She survived the 94, I think it was 94, genocide in Rwanda. You remember that terrible thing that happened? If you get a chance, it's pretty gruesome, pretty intense. If you want to watch the movie Hotel Rwanda, old movie, but really scary to see what happened. Um, so she survived that. And, but on fire for the Lord. She actually married a farmer in Sioux Falls. <laughs> and just a great guy. Her children were stuck in Rwanda. The last time I spoke to her, she went over to get them. Something happened where she's in prison. I don't know that she is released yet. I haven't heard from, I don't even know if she's alive, to be quite honest with you. Um, and then our kids got involved, again, they raised money, they were just so amazing. We got involved in human trafficking, sex trafficking to be more specific, and we got involved in a ministry called Love 146. And the kids raised enough money, they brought somebody from this organization and they spoke about human trafficking. Um, and again, it was just eye-opening to hear what is happening in our world with this horrendous, horrendous crime that is happening. And so, when we look at all of this stuff that is going on in our world, there's no way that we can say, you know what, social justice is a liberal thing or a left thing whatever you want to call it, and then the church to say, I'm just going to shut my eyes, let me just pray for you, hallelujah. And, we don't, and, and the prayer is good, I'm not mocking the prayer. But there has to be action to it. And that's what I want to get around today about just biblical justice. We need to be the light, we need to speak to some of this stuff. So let me share with you several things for us to build upon for next week as well. Let me give you one definition between the difference between biblical justice and social justice. I think you'll be able to remember this one. In contrast to social justice, which focus on a temporal view of addressing injustice, injustices in society, Biblical justice starts with the internal in mind. It starts by seeing people or seeing people as God sees them. This is the key piece for me. Recognizing that we are all created in the image of God. And it is the responsibility upon Christ's followers to pursue physical and spiritual freedom for the oppressed. So others can also become what God created them to be. If we have experienced freedom, how can we not pursue freedom on behalf of others? And just to remind us, we think about the image of God, we obviously have this um, word, the, the Latin word, imago Dei, or the image of God, it means in likeness or similarity to God, Humans are created with unique abilities uh, absent in all other creatures of the earth that mirror the divine 
nature of God. And so this is the key thing as we think about biblical justice is to look and see the image of God and to say we are all equal. We're all equal. And I'll speak to some of the stuff that is happening in South Africa and things that, that I've been wrestling and dealing with in my own life over the years, just growing up in apartheid. Um, what we need to know is before we look at our main image, and again, just a note, I've left a lot of resources for you in the Bible app. Please work through it this week. There's a lot of videos. There's a curriculum, there's a recommendation for a video for you to go and watch as well. So that will keep you busy this whole week. So our biblical justice is very much found, founded in God. We cannot do it, I believe, effectively without seeing this quality, this characteristic in God. So we got to know this morning that God is just. Can I hear amen? It is part of his character, which means he is always just. He's the same yesterday, today, tomorrow. Hallelujah, he's not functioning on his emotions <laughs> like we do, right? Um, now he's mad, now he's not. All the drama. He's just, and he's the same. Psalm 89, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. That's part of who God is. You can also go and see Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. Please write that down for homework. Now, I wanted to use a, a key Scripture that you will see everywhere. You will see it on church billboards. You will see it on cups. You will see it on clothing. Unfortunately, in a sense, social justice has hijacked this passage. And it's a powerful passage. But again, it's a little bit like that slime, how we take this verse and we use it to highlight kind of my agenda. And this is the, the challenge. We always have to be people of context. And so I want to just give you a little bit of context and then we'll build around this. So Micah 6, verse 8. And like I said, it's a great passage. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Now, I said, if we just look at that and not look at context, it won't be quite as clear to us like, hey, what is happening here? I want to encourage you to grab a commentary to dig a little deeper because there's some powerful Hebrew words in here um, that is going to just be mind-blowing for you. And so even as you look at that first, he has shown you, when you look at the Hebrew, it actually points to demands. What does the Lord demand of us as believers? Now, look at Micah 6, um, verse 3. Now, when you look at this passage, it has kind of a, a, a courtroom feel to it. And so there's, a, there's some legal terms in here. And it's also a covenant. It's, it's a, a covenant conversation that is happening. So what, is, uh, what has happened is you have God's people who is covenant people, and they have broke, they've broken the covenant with God. And so in a sense, now you see them having this courtroom conversation. So look at verse um, 2 be there. For the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? So he's telling them, it's like, hey, I've got a case against you. And now God is saying, I've been just, I'm faithful. So he's asking, my people, what have I done to you? 
How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. Now they're kind of, they're feeling guilty and they're asking, how do I respond? It's like, yeah, Lord, we have broken this covenant with you. What can I do? So this is their response. Uh, look at verse 6 there. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? And then they go really crazy. Um, oh, sorry, that was with the firstborns. And then verse 8, now Micah, uh, God through the prophet Micah says, he has shown you. O oh, mortal, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. We see such a redemptive, redemptive message again in here where God's people break the covenant and now they want to fix it, right? They want to come with their offerings. Like, well, uh, if, I, if I bring... Uh, more animals, if I bring oil, let's, let's just fix this. What are some outward experiences that, things that I can do to fix this relationship? And God is saying, none of those externals is going to do it. I want more. I need something internal to happen. I need for you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. It is amazing when you look at that passage, and you can just make a note, you can study this a little later, with act justly and to love mercy. It is a horizontal relationship that he's talking about here. And then when you walk humbly with your God, now he talks about a vertical relationship with God. We might get back to that a little later. I also want you to make a note there, right underneath there. Put down Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10. You will find the same tone here. Uh, verse 12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul, and to, obe uh, to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. Same tone. And so through Micah 6, and as he's pointing back to Deuteronomy, which is pointing us to the Ten Commandments, because again, he's talking within covenant here. And so he's saying, how do we walk justly? Part of that is follow the commandments. And when you look at the Ten Commandments, again, the first three focus on our vertical relationship with God. The last six focus on the relationship with God's people. And so he's giving us some clues here on how to walk justly. Now, Micah, the prophet Micah, wasn't the only one that was declaring this stuff. A hundred years earlier, another prophet shares this with us, Amos 5. I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Hard words. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. But let justice, have you heard this song before? 
But let justice roll on like a river. Righteousness like a never failing stream. We're not done. Isaiah 1, 16 and 17. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your, your, take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do the right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widows. I can go on and on and on and on. In context with all of these passages, God's people, when you read Isaiah, the, the previous verses, there's so much injustice that's happening. They're cheating people. They're stealing money from the widows. They're adding high taxes. And then they want to come to church <laughs> and do their offerings and worship God. And the prophets have to come in and say, it's meaningless. It's meaningless. I believe that same challenge and biblical truth is true for us as well. That God is calling us to be people that walk in justice, that love mercy. There is no way that we can act holy, and I'm not talking to this church. It's the church on the other corner of the town. It's the church in South Africa. Now I'm going to make everyone upset in South Africa. Um, you cannot worship God and think you can steal, be corrupt, and turn a blind eye on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then on Sunday, we want to come and look all holy and righteous. It doesn't work that way. God will not hear your cry. He's a God that is just. And so it's amazing how he has used the prophets and people to speak to some of these injustices that is happening. Because he's a God that is just. And in the same way, I believe, one definition, give me one more definition, something that you can kind of just easy to remember. When you think about social justice and biblical justice, so, much, so many times social justice is focused on um, bigger organizations. It talks a lot about, uh, in, a, in a political concept, um, or, or companies. But biblical justice very much focus in on the individual and on the church. And so when we look at all of the stuff that is happening around our world, God needs his church, you as an individual, to get your hands dirty, to get passionate about one of these, you know, something where you can serve and make a difference. I believe it with all of my heart. I see it throughout scripture. And so I was just quickly, I mean, I can probably do four pages of negative stuff that is going on. So I was just thinking about, um, the AIDS, Sub-Saharan African area, 11 million AIDS orphans. Um, and when we sit in the Louvre, it really doesn't affect our hearts, right? But when you, I think about our last mission trip to South Africa, we worked with this tiny little ministry where they're taking in these AIDS orphans, their parents either died or just left them on the street. And here's this company, not with a whole lot of money, they're on this little farm, and they're looking after these kids. 
I mean, just quietly. They're not doing a big Facebook thing. They're just quietly looking after these kids. And I'll never forget, I'm just uh, Heidi and Heather and our other kids, but especially those two, I remember just uh, looking, sitting on the chair with these AIDS-infected kids and just loving on them. And it's when you're in that moment where it breaks your heart because you wonder about their future and you wonder how is this organization going to sustain itself to make a difference in the lives of these kids. There's so many issues that us, us as a church, we can't go and tackle all of that stuff, right? But I think that's why it's so important to, to get excited about one thing that you pray about. Say, God, how can I get passionate? What have you called me into this world where I can show biblical justice? Where I can be your hands and your feet? And then we can launch you and we can stand with you and we can get excited with you. Human trafficking. Uh, I was looking at a number just in the US and now I can't remember what that number was. But I mean, the US is such a hot spot. Uh, I know Atlanta is huge. I know Chicago is huge. I know Vegas. And I know there's some of that stuff that's happening in our backyard, right? And it's something that we need to get excited about. Abortion. Now, unfortunately, this is such a hot topic again within politics. Um, but this is such an injustice when I think about abortion. And my heart, because I have seen what it has done, I've, um, I want to be careful here. I had a personal encounter with a, a teenager that made a decision to get their baby aborted. And years later in marriage, as they were getting and were doing some counseling and stuff, the guilt and the shame that goes with that. And so I get so frustrated that we bring in abortions into even our polit political realm. Because for me, scripture is so clear. I mean, at least for me, you might have other scriptures and you can try, but this is just for me, it's a no-go zone. I cannot see that anybody's ever going to change my mind on this. I know that there's some, some weird cases and, I mean, some hurtful, painful, difficult things that people wrestle with in this moment. So I don't say that this stuff is easy. But all I know is I'm just, I want it, it to, it is just a hot topic. But for me, God gives life. And I just look at some of these scriptures and I think about abortions per hour, 98 abortions in the U.S. alone. In the U.S. alone. Now again, let me say this. With this particular person that the Lord has brought into my life that has made this bad decision back in the day, we're young. That's the beauty of restorative justice because that particular person is married loves the Lord super involved in her church has beautiful kids the Lord has restored and has shown grace and for all of these things I think it is it is it is true Hunger, I've talked a little about it. Next week, I'll talk a little bit more about racism on some of my thoughts. And again, as we look at scripture. South African farmers. This is a, a really passionate topic for me. So I want to just I wanna share with you a little bit on what's happening in South Africa. So I grew up in apartheid. Um, my parents raised me to 
love all people, to respect all people, but unfortunately sometimes you become part of the system, right? And um, you look down maybe on people of color, um, whatever that case might be. And um, so the world got really crazy in South Africa. There was such a strong voice against racism, which is good because racism is not from God. And we have to speak to it. And then in 94, it was when uh, President Nelson Mandela got released, 95, he became the president. And there was a whole reverse racism that has happened in South Africa, unfortunately. And there's some stuff that I'll share today that you probably won't understand until you live in South Africa. Not all, but there's uh, such a hatred for white South Africans in the country. And over the last maybe 10 years, maybe it's even longer, but at least maybe the last five years, there's such an ug ugly injustice that's happening in my country where young people will go into farms and they will torture these farmers. And then after they've tortured them and did horrendous things, we've got too many kids. I wanna encourage you to go and read, go and Google this. And it's just, it's insane, the hatred that is happening in South Africa, it's, it's, the, it's a beautiful country. It is such an impressive country and there's so many good people. But this injustice that is happening daily. And you know what makes me so mad is that we're, that the world is quiet. That the world is so quiet. And I'm frustrated because I don't know what to do. I don't have the solution. I don't know how to fix that problem. I'm, I'm an ocean separated from them. I don't have the resources. I can just maybe share it with you and ask that you will pray for my country. And so I need you to know that although we are sheltered from many things, in the Louvre, we are so blessed, and I don't feel guilt, don't feel shame. But I want you to know that there's so much injustice happening in our world. That's just one. I can talk about India. I can probably talk about Indonesia. Um, so the church needs to figure out that passion and to say, Lord, give me that stirring that I see all people in God's image. And as a kid, and I said, even sometimes when I go back, I have to fight maybe a spirit, although I'm, you know, I don't wanna just throw away this thing to say, I'm not a racist. I'm not, I don't, I, if, I, if I've done deep research in my own heart, or not research, but just kind of lamenting. But when you go back and you see the torture and the murders that is happening, there's sometimes there's such a, revenge, a revenge, uh, revengeful spirit. Let me tell you sometimes some things that happens. And I'm sorry I'm telling you the ugly stuff. It might be easier for you when I tell you stuff in South Africa, then, you don't, then we don't have to face what's happening in America. Sometimes when you go park, you're in a store, you go to Super One, you'll have people that comes in, if you're a white South African, and they'll block you on both ends that you can't get back into your car. So there's hundreds of things like that that is happening in the country. And when you go back and you see these things, there's sometimes an anger and then you kind of want to go back to that, 
maybe unhealthy biblical things. And then I have to go before the Lord and say, Lord, I, I apologize. I repent of the stuff that is going on in my heart. Help me to see all of South Africans in your image. Because it's only then that my heart can be broken and that I can actually be meaningful and helpful. Now, we don't have that issue. But I wonder sometimes when we think about, maybe we think about our neighbors, about Mexico. Maybe it's something else. And I think the worst thing that we can do as the church is to just immediately say, I'm not a racist. And I believe it. I don't see anybody here that I'm going to say, man, this guy's got an issue. But I don't also, I don't want to remove that moment for us to go into lament and just say, Lord, is there some things that sometimes stir up in my own heart that is not from you, where I see people less than the image of God? So what's our response? My attitude, my attitude towards, the goal, towards the goal of justice is to seek justice. My position as a believer towards the victims of injustice should be to defend them. And then my action towards injustice needs to be to take it up. Leave you with this last quote. In order to do justice, I need to calibrate my conscience to the word of God. I am so grateful that we have a just God. And because of that, We deserved hell. Because of all the stuff that we got involved in, right? <laughs> and because Romans reminds us that we all fall short of the glory of God. And because he is just, he said, I got to make a way. And that way is Jesus. And it is so amazing that God can take a sinner like me full of issues that fall short and that God can send his son to die on the cross for Stephen. And in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ through the blood of Jesus, I get picked up. I don't have to walk in my guilt and my shame. And now because of restorative justice, I am made righteous. The greatest privilege that we have when it comes to biblical justice is to be restorative in nature and to remind people that we're in this together, what God has done for us all. And I want to encourage you to find a spot, get a ministry that you can get passionate about, that you will pursue and say, man, I'm going to just, I'm going to help. And then live out Micah 6, verse 8. Are you walking justly? Do you love mercy? And are you walking humbly, humbling with you? <laughs> with your God. The team is going to lead us just in a song. I want you to just, you can either look at the words. I want you to just stay seated. And I want you to ask, how are you doing with Micah 6?
God of justice, Savior to all. You came to rescue the weak and the poor. Chose to serve and not to be served. Jesus, you have called us, freely we receive now, freely we will give, we must go, lift to feet the hungry, stand beside the Just every day, loving mercy in every way, walking humbly before you, God. You have shown us what you require. Freely we receive now, freely we will give, we must go, lift to feed the hungry, stand beside the broken, we must go, stepping forward, keep us from just singing, move us into Send us out, fill us up and send us out, fill us up and send us out, Lord. Fill us up and send us out, fill us up and send us out, fill us up and send us out, Lord. Fill us up and send us out, fill us up and send us out. Father, we want to make this our prayer this morning. Holy Spirit, come and work in every one of our hearts and those online, those watching all over the world. Come and work in our hearts. Come and fill us up and send us out to be Jesus to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Why don't you stand with us? We're going to do the closing song together.
Hallelujah. Well, I want to give you just a quick reminder. There are some subway cards left if you want to support the youth group. Um, there's coffee. Enjoy the coffee together. And if you have time, run downstairs and have a look at what we've been doing down there. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful Sunday.